breaks, sleeping in cars and shelters. Despite the startling statistics of less than 4% of aged out Fosh youth graduating from college, Kevin earned a bachelor's degree in social work from Cleveland State University. Kevin has worked closely with presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, United States Secretary of the State, John Kerry, and Congresswoman Marsha Fudge. Poised, passionate, and personal, Kevin has served as Cleveland liaison for the Black Entertainment Television Foundation, recruiting over 250 men, excuse me, females for an empowerment summit at John Carroll University. She is also the founder of Hashtag Foster Care, a nonprofit organization that engages celebrities and elected officials in the flight of foster youth. Hashtag Foster Care was founded September 11, 2015. She has gained attention from the Sean Carter Foundation and Rock Nation. As Kevin continues to beat the odds, she used her story to lay a foundation that brings awareness and resources to aid others in foster care. Kevin credits a bulk of her success to a social worker from Cahuga County Department of Children and Family Services. However, her biggest accomplishment in life is having her six-year-old son, Kay and Larry. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute. This is supposed to be the lit conference, man. And we really appreciate you doing an introduction like that and everything. But, like I said, this is a leader of inspiring transformation conference. And what I need is I need everybody on their feet right now, please. On your feet. Right? Um, seven years at Cleveland State. I like 
the professional you in who drops classes, go back. So if you did that, I'm just like you. And I feel like in order for us to be lit, we have to be real. So I want this conversation to be really engaging. So I'm going to be very transparent about some things. And I'm hoping that you're in a space and that this is a safe place where you can be honest. What my bio didn't share is some of my insecurities in terms of the trauma, right? If you had a mother who was bipolar, I'm just like you. A father who went in and out of prison, I'm just like you. If you have been touched inappropriately, me too. And if you have also been in a domestic violence situation, me too. And so part of what has gotten me where I'm at is transparency. And so I wanted to leave you guys with some tools that I've used. I feel like transparency creates currency. Remember that. <laughs> I said that because I've always been honest about who and what I was, even in pursuit to my degree. I was honest with professors, I was honest with the therapists that I was going to see, and I was honest with myself, even though I felt like I couldn't do it. So my transparency has afforded me these opportunities. And I wanted to share one of the videos with you. You're fine? Don't worry about it. We'll talk about it. What ended up happening after I graduated from Cleveland State is I was so grateful. Like, oh my God, <laughs> I have a degree. My degree is in social work. I was like, oh All right. So one of the videos that I want, I want to show you is my gumption. I don't operate in the fear of loss. If it makes my heart beat, and my heart has been beating the entire time, I have to do it. So I went to this event at the City Club in Cleveland. And the president of the university was there. It's going to show, right? Yeah, okay, whatever. Okay. <laughs> visualize with me, visualize with me. He's there, he's on stage, and he's talking about all the stuff Cleveland State said. And I was like, hello, hi. Um, I need to uh, tell my, you know, I basically told my story about sleeping in my car and shelters and my pursuit to my degree. See, when I went to college, it was proposed to me as like my 14th placement. I was in 13 different placements. And what was said was that my social worker said to me, Kevin, the foster parent's not going to keep you. And so I was like, okay. So on my 18th birthday, they took me to court. When I was in court, um, I heard them say that emancipation, and I was like, emancipation? Emancipation? Proclamation like they did? Like, <laughs> this is wrong, right? I get back to the foster home, the foster parents just like, well, Kevin, they're going to have to pay me $250 for rent. And at that time, I was working at the airport. There was no way in hell that I would give her $250. One, I wasn't going to be able to buy Jordans anymore. <laughs> and two, it was like, your house is really like an orphanage. I'm not paying you to stay here. So the social worker comes back and said, well, Kevin, you got to go to college. And I was like, college? you got to be smart to go to college. I went to five different high schools. It took me to the 12th grade to pass my eighth grade math proficiency test. So I thought you had to be very smart to go to college, which, if you're here, and you're not smart or don't think you're smart, and you're getting the grades, clearly that, that's not the case, right? Because we talked about this in the bathroom, that there's this misconception that you have to be smart to get a degree. And that's not true. You need people skills. You need soft skills. You need to show up. You need to be transparent, because transparency creates currency. So I was always transparent with professors about everything I was going through. We're going to watch the video now. This is what I did to my professor. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can on YouTube too. This is what I did. I'm sorry, not my professor. What I did to the president of the university that landed Cleveland State $2.3 million for foster kids to go to college in Cleveland. Hmm. Yeah. His face is so red. <laughs> <laughs>
because anyone who could go through foster care and be able to go from home to home to home to home to home and deal with different personalities, different smells, different textures of food, different religions, is a warrior. So I felt like when people go to the military, they get stripes. And I felt like the whole hashtag foster care movement was a strike. And to be able to wear the foster kid shirt was also a strike in a way to engage people to start looking at the fights of foster youth. City Club questions. We encourage you to formulate your questions now and remind you to keep them brief and to the point. We welcome you to the City Club Forum, to our television and radio audience, and to those present in this room, especially to those of you who are guests. We hope you will join the City Club and become active in our ongoing civic dialogue. We welcome guests at tables hosted by Baker Hostetler, Donald Cairns, Cleveland State University, Cuyahoga Community College, Friends of Joe Simperman, Medical Mutual of Ohio, Patrick A. Sweeney, Richard L. Bowen and Associates, and the Unger International Center for Local Government Leadership. Thank you for joining us today. Today is the Paul and Sonia Unger International Forum on Cleveland in the World. And Paul Unger was a longtime City Club member, 
And he co-chaired the City Club's 75th anniversary, The Power of Ideas, in 1987. He and his wife, Sonia, have been active in many parts of our community, including a special connection to Cleveland State University. Paul passed away last year, and his misfire members and friends. Up, so With us today at the head table is Paul's wife, Sonia Unger, and his sons, Alan and Jerry. Will the family members please stand and be recognized? The board continues to consult on all major appointments, but to go through a ratification process, a full rat need an education because they the people who really need <laughs> I mean to say such a thing. Uh, Dr. Would you like to come up here? <laughs> yeah, I actually <laughs> this question. I'm happy that uh, council people are in the room a really good uh, opportunity for me to say such a thing. I think that you're a very awesome speaker and your interest in urban development is fantastic. You're an asset to Cleveland State University and I wish that you were there when I came because you're open to helping people who really need the help. I went to Cleveland State because I needed to find a place to get out of my foster home. And I'm saying this not because I want the oohs and the ahs, but just to say it because People who are in foster care need an education because they don't have the family connections later. There is no support system. I wanted to know if you would be open to creating a partnership with the Department of Children and Family Services. They're up the street from you, but not only that, after my first year in college, I ended up homeless because of a lack of support systems. It took me seven years to finish my degree. From Cleveland State, so I'm happy to say that I am an alumni from Cleveland State University. But the foster kids who are coming to Cleveland State University or who are going to try C will not have the support system nor the self-efficacy that I got while going to Cleveland State. So they need a backbone at a university. Would you be open to doing such a thing? Well, I, I think you actually should be up here. <laughs> <laughs> Because you just told the story with more truth yeah. than all. Okay, so there's a point for me showing you guys that, right? It only takes one person to change your entire life, just one. And had I not attended Cleveland State because I needed a place to live, other kids wouldn't have an opportunity to go to Cleveland State for free. So they have gotten a cumulative, look at me. See, you don't have to know how to pronounce words, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, they have gotten a
However, if there's nothing to replace it, you're just basically passing down trauma to your children and making the same mistakes over and over and over again. So I want to be honest, which is why I want to make it interactive, because who's the most important person in the room? Y'all, not me. What am I doing? I'm still earning and learning. I'm not the most important person in the room. For the people who are 18, 19, 20, 21, you guys are in an awesome space. Right now we have technology. I didn't have technology back then when I was like going through Cleveland State. You guys have the best of the best. You can just get on Instagram, tell your story, and start getting booked and being able to create exposure opportunities for yourself. So of course, most of you know that this is like escape, right? <laughs> I, I want to. I think I want to go to the cool part. Rejection. I've been rejected so many times. So many times, right? No one adopted me. I was in 13 different places, and look at how cute I am. <laughs> Foster care. 
Here's the cool part. I had already set this goal when I was in my depression state, and I mean, I was depressed. I was like real depressed. I had kicked out my condo, car got repossessed. You know, anything that could go wrong, it did that year. And I don't know about you, when I journal, I don't journal about what I'm going through. I journal about what I want to have. So I put this goal in a book, and I was like, I want celebrities to help me brand foster care. And that goal just set, and it planted, and like six years later, this is what manifests. DMC asked me, could I come to New York? I didn't want to keep taking pictures with some celebrities just to show off to people that I made it. You know how we do. <laughs> get my nose by Louis Vuitton, shut down, uh, to prove that we have acquired success, but that's not success. And here's what manifested. It's been three years of me traveling the world, getting celebrities to hold a foster care sign, to talk about the data so that it trends in a way that we are not so oppressed. The last thing I like to do is get up here and say, oh my God, I'm in 13 foster homes. They slept in my car and shelters. Because most people will be like, oh, you poor thing. And then they don't have the vibration to empathize in action. And so action has created this, right? I got up and I did something about it, which is why I'm saying that if you are in foster care, your story will make room for you. you. Don't have to be the smartest person. I can't even pronounce half the words I'm trying to say between cool for y'all, right? <laughs> All you have to do is like get something that you believe in. So I train trauma. Trauma is real. We're inherited from our parents. You know what I mean? There's some things I still have not gotten over. As much as I see this ther uh, therapist on Friday, <coughs> clearly I missed the day, so I'm a little off. Um, it's some things that I'm just never going to get over. It's interesting. My social worker, who took me to my very first foster home, walked in a room one day. I didn't even have to turn around. I could smell this one, but she still smelled the same from back in the day. I don't know if she's. What perfume it was, I turned around and said, you took me to my very first foster home. And she looked at me like, I don't remember you. Of course you don't. You're taking so many kids to foster care. You don't remember me. So I, I was able to tell her, you have a car that says taken to. And she looked at me like, wow, I still have that car. I was thinking, jeez, is it no pay raises? Why are you saying that? <laughs> Lady, what started to happen? I don't know if you 
follow me on social media. I know Shay does. Um, she told me she's been following me for a year and I didn't feel really good. She actually put this together because I'm nothing administrative and I left my flash drive, just to be honest. I said we would be honest here. <laughs> I'm going to throw her in jersey. But okay, this young lady came to me in my DM and I lost my grandmother. She kept sending me all this positive stuff. I'm like, oh my God, this is great. This is good. And I asked her, can I have your address so I can send you a hashtag post repairs for sure? She was just like, I can't give it to you. I'm staying in a motel room. And I was just like, okay. Well, are you open to tell me like what's going on? She tells me what's happening. She didn't want to. I had to like pump her up. I said, look, what if I put your story on my social media page and someone sees it and they want to help you? I'm not in a financial position to come to uh, Compton to help you. I'm just not. This is a call me. So not only did this celebrity pay her rent for a year, a whole year, that's that transparency creates currency. People care about what people think. People can't get you out your position. And if they cared about what you, what you were going through, they would be an adder and a multiplier, not a divider. So paid her rent for a whole year, got her out of the motel room, bought clothes for her daughter, and Sizzle also paid uh, for a set of twins prom. And I think that's important to say because most people like are so embarrassed to tell their foster care story. Like, why? You're a warrior. Tell everything you know so that you help someone else. In addition to that, what this campaign has allowed celebrities to do is empathize in action. No, I have not gotten money from all these people. I'm praying on it, okay? <laughs> Plus, I think it's kind of tacky if you go up to them like, hey, I'm Kevin, I'm a foster care, I need some money. No, I like to build authentic relationships, right? But this campaign has trended so well that people are making signs. So I think I think you had uh, Simone Biles up. She made her own sign. Um, DMC, I saw DMC. Up. This man has changed my life. I met him in 2009. I have to tell you this because I know I like to tell the story. Real quick. <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at home and I'm ironing my clothes. I don't watch the news. I have enough goddamn problems, right? I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. And I'm ironing my clothes, and I heard him say, he's being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland. I heard him say, um, you gotta be careful how you treat foster kids, because one day they can be inducted into the Rock Hall. And I just looked up like, whoa! I'm like, oh my god, he was in foster care? I gotta meet him. That's that law of attraction thing, like, I think what I want all the time. And so, someone invites me to come to an event and speak, and he's there, and I tell my story. Transparency creates currency. And he's like, oh my god, I want you in my documentary. And I'm like, me? Perfect. <laughs> he kept his word and he's still been around. And honestly, if I'd be completely transparent, had I not met him, hashtag foster care wouldn't exist because he invited me to the event in New York that afforded me the opportunity. I know you like politics. Do you guys know who this is? Yeah. Okay, I won't go there. Do you know who this is? to happen. When you position yourself and you hang around people who have more than you, you're going to be the next person that has more. So the more I hung around people that go after their goals and dreams and know how to get to the next level, it positioned me to do that. On this particular day, we didn't put it in the slide, Paris Hilton did an event for foster youth that um, they raised money through yoga. And uh, Sheila Jaffe is a casting director who was also adopted. And this young lady was a foster kid too. <coughs> That's my grand finale. I don't know how much time I got because I don't see my person lifting the sign. But here's what I want to do. Honestly, I want to know if anyone wants to ask me questions. Um, because I feel like we have not, because we ask not, and Shay, I really want to work with you. So if you have questions for me, go. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Why not? It's funny because I um, had an opportunity to be in San Diego. I'm here for some conferences to work. And getting up this morning, it's like, do I go and help out and set up this conference where I really don't have to be there? And I've been going back and forth with like, you know, I was invited by um, Tane, and I'm like, okay, let me see. Do I go and show up and keep my word? Because I said I was going to check her event out. And so I called her and I said, yo, you guys got to set up. I'm going to go and offer this event. And then something told me, it's like, you know, like you said, if you ask, you just have not. I'm going to be honest. I wasn't a foster care youth, but I got foster care. 
I went through a lot of stuff that many foster care youth went through, um, and CPS used to come to my house all the time. And I heard that if we come to this door one more time, we're taking her. So the time that they came, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, I got on my bike and rode. I lived in uh, um, East Point, Georgia at the time. And I got, climbed out my window, rode my bike, and hid behind a tree for hours. And, my mom, and then I climbed back in the window, and my mom looked at me with tears in her eyes, and she's like, I know why you left, I know why you left. And so there's been many times where I actually dodged it. And so I commend all of you guys, you know, I love you guys, I know that's weird, but I tell that to everybody. But I don't know, I have a, um, my organization is called Chase Your Throne, and mine is about, regardless of your outside circumstances, inclusive of the things that you guys go through, regardless, you can surpass those things by just, as you stated, thought management, manifesting things in your life. I'm the youngest of my mother's five girls. I'm the only one who graduated high school, only one who went to college. Right now, currently pursuing my PhD in trying to make <laughs> how or what I can help or work with or anybody here in Blue Sleep with Sade. That's why I came. I'm excited. I think you're dope. I think this information is, is amazing. And I work with schools right now with um, homeless youth um, down around in Pomona, California. I go and speak and things like that. And they have a huge foster care and I'm trying to work with them as well. I don't think that we're any different. I've been homeless. I've left in shelters. Um, I had my mother's friends who kind of fostered me, so I didn't stay in the system. But hey, that's what I just wanted to say. Because if you don't ask, like you said, you don't have. But I'm willing to connect and work and see what you're doing. And it's just me. I finance my I, through my nine to five. I, I finance my own company. I'm not here for handouts or anything like that. But to just communicate and work and network. So. Like, I really commend you. PhD? Okay. <laughs> I tell everybody, I'm not the smartest. I just worked hard. It's not right. what I wanted. I didn't know what I wanted, but I knew what I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be mm -hmm. enough statistic. I didn't want to be dependent on anybody. I know what it feels to be broke, hungry. The shelter was my only, only stability. When I, we got snatched from the shelter because my mother was on drugs, so we got kicked out. And so when I think about that, that was my only safety net. And so that gives me a lot of heart for these kids because I know what it feels to finally have stability that shelter, people like, oh, that was my home. You know what I mean? And so to be snatched from that, and I tell everybody, I'm not the smartest one in the world. It's just that I know what I don't want to see for myself. I have a 13-year-old son that would never feel whatever I felt, so I get it. But I, I feel you when you say, I'm not the smartest one in the world, I just work hard. <laughs> Kids, but I feel very good to be precious to say that they are a priority. Yes. Um, simply because of the boys. The boys are real, man. Like the entire time you're in foster care, it ultimately makes you a habitual, <laughs> compulsive liar. You see foster kids, and you're like, that was a lie. Why did you lie about that? Well, I had to lie about who my mother was, lie about who, you know, I mean, not my mother, but who this person was that has me now. Oh, this is my cousin, this is my auntie. This is, you know, you lie, because that's not who it is. And sometimes those behaviors carry on. So, no, I don't just work with foster kids, but they are a priority. And if I be completely transparent, because I said that I would, my trauma, me not getting the therapy and the tools that I needed, is e even though I was in front of all these people doing this, I still wasn't making good decisions. My son's father was someone who was also adopted, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is sick. Listen to this. When you don't work on yourself, you attract people who are on the same frequency as you. So I met a man and I was excited. Oh my God, you were adopted? I'm gonna love you, I'm gonna hug you, I'm gonna squeeze you, I'm gonna, no, sis, no. I had no business in that. That's where the domestic violence came from. And so here's where my empathy and action works because I, was, I became the same person that my mother was without even having to ever grow up with her. My biological father was very abusive to my mother. Never saw it, she told me about it. But I was also the same girl that was on the other side of the seat with a social work degree, with a social worker coming over to my house for my son. You know what I'm saying? So the reason why I'm always very clear and very transparent about who and what I am is because don't let none of this fool, none of this means nothing. None of it means nothing, right? Every time I walked in a room and I talked about my transparency created currency, it created other opportunities for foster youth. What ended up happening, out of hashtag foster care, outside of people getting their rent paid, 
I've been able to give them so many exposure opportunities. They went to Jay-Z's concert. They sat courtside. They jumped in and out of private jets. I make it very, very, very fancy. I'm like the concierge service of foster care. Because I feel like if you had your parents, you would have the social capital that you need. You would have the exposure opportunities that you need if you had your parents. So for me, being, being able to even stand up here today and talk to you guys without crying about my story, making you guys laugh about my pain, this is not funny, guys. I'm supposed to be a therapist. <laughs> um, it, it's to do what you, what you did, to have people stand up, beat their chest, and be honest about they, their situations. Because you can't be lit if you can't be real. You feel me? And I have never, ever, 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 ever said the wrong thing to the right person. Never. And I don't care what I said. I've never said the wrong thing to the right person. So I'm encouraging people to get in contact with me after this. I definitely would hook up with you. If there is no more questions, is it? I know somebody would ask you something. <laughs> don't let that fear mess you up. All right. It's not a question, but going back, you say you're about to be 35? I'll be 35. You are. <laughs> you said that and I had to pause for a second because I said, how old? <laughs> well, not old, but you and me. So, I mean, <laughs> I just thought it was really cool that, like, you pointing that out. It's just, sometimes you can tell when people live in a stressful environment where they have a lot going on. You can see it starts to, they're aging and it's really wearing down negatively on them. But just meeting you, even just taking the picture outside for Instagram, just talking to you in the hallway before we hyped you up and brought you in, like none of the things you said were apparent. I never would have guessed anything like that about you, and I think it's really cool that you're able to, it's not like you're putting on a facade, but you're just living for you and you're doing things to give back to other people, and you're not letting everything that's been a burden to you kind of be a reflection of who or what you are. So I just wanted to say I can that. Thank you. I appreciate that for two reasons. One, well, I think what keeps me sane is really believing that my life is like a movie. You know what I mean? Like my life is really like a movie. And each time it gets better and better, even though it's a whole bunch of hell on the other side of it, each time it's progressively gotten better. You're looking at somebody that should have three felonies. I don't want to tell you all about one, but I found it. <laughs> I was in the first offenders program three times. Um, for the tiny stuff, the silly stuff. I just, I couldn't lay down for it. I had to take it, whatever. Um, and you're looking at someone who tried to commit suicide at 12. Imagine me going at 12. So if you ever had those thoughts, guess what? Me too. It came back in my mid-20s. For me to even feel like that, like take my life because I was trying to give love to someone who experienced foster care, that's deep. That's really deep. And those are the type of conversations I like to have and what I want to hear when I'm investing my time because you can't get this time back. The time that you're giving me, you can't get it back. And granted you can because, you know, Miss Jade, she's cool, she's synonymous for what she does, she's been very fixated on this event, but this is still your time. So why have someone up here that's suited and booted with a cute wig on? I should have told y'all that. <laughs> <laughs> and not be real. What are we here for? You know what I mean? Why? You got dream makers, dream takers, and dream fakers. I'm a dream maker. I'm a dream maker. Dream makers, dream takers, and dream makers. I'm not going to be fake about anything because my transparency has afforded me all this stuff that y'all saw. And guess what? For two years of building this, I was on welfare doing it, swiping an EBT card. Lips are so deceiving. Lips are very, very deceiving, right? But when you set goals and you really visualize yourself getting to the next level, I go test drive the cars I want to uh, drive. I go to open houses. I ain't got no money, you know, <laughs> for the ones that I used to go to. And guess what? That Those things have manifested for me. I own three properties outright in Cleveland because I put myself in the habit of having it right now. And I feel like when you're in foster care, you forget to dream. The only thing that you're doing is trying to survive every single day. Like you're on a treadmill. You're going absolutely positively nowhere just trying to survive. If you guys take away nothing from what I talked about today, just start dreaming again. Like a little kid. You can't tell a kid they're not like Spider Man. You can't tell my son that he's not Spider Man. You know what I'm saying? Uh oh. Oh, she's going out. And how many minutes is it? Five. Cool. 
This last, the last thing that I wanted to show you guys came out of visualization. Like I said, I made my dream board in 2007. And in the midst of making that board, there's only one person I wholeheartedly want to meet. Who is it, Shay? It's Jay-Z. <laughs> that's it. That's all. That's like, I swear, everyone else, I'm not going to get them. Oh, hi, I want you to I give them my little spiel. You got to have your spiel. I'm Kevin Gilmore, the digital activist, the creator of hashtag foster care. I need celebrities and elected officials in the fight of foster care. Boom. We give them the sign. In and out. Right? Always have your in and out. But it was crazy. And this is how I know I can never say the wrong thing to a right person. I walked in this event that Dan Jones was going to be at. I didn't walk in. I stuck in the back. I stuck in the back of this event that Dan Jones was going to be at. And I wanted him to meet me so bad because he talks about felonies. And I'm like, damn, if I didn't have a felony back then, I could have gotten custody of my siblings. So I'm walking. And here's another thing. If you ever get in someone, just keep walking. Just walk. keep walking. Just walk. Just walk. And I got my time. And the lady's like, stop. And you are. You know, I do my spell, Kevin Gilmore, did my after this hashtag foster care, I'm coming to get Dan Jones' picture. And she was like, you're asking for a lot. And I was like, ugh, <laughs> sis, no, I'm not. I asked for enough. I get to show her all the people that I met. I don't know where I went. All the people that I met, right? Where is it? Focus on you. You can't, you can't. 
You can't get that time back. Your whole goal should be, every day you wake up in the morning, is how can I make myself a better person? How can I live my dreams? How can I go after my goals and dreams? Who do I need to be around that's an adder, a multiplier, and not a divider? And sometimes your parents are the divider. Adders and multipliers, not subtractors. Sometimes they're subtractors too. Dream makers, dream fakers, dream takers. Sometimes they're dream fakers and dream takers. Unfortunately, jealousy in some instances can be very healthy. Sometimes you see girls who are like, damn, I want that car, I want the bundles, I want that bag, right? So nothing makes you get up to think that if I go to college, potentially I can get those things. Envy is something else. And sometimes parents envy their children. So I would just say, focus on you. She's the same, same person from 13 to 35.
hashtag foster care isn't just a slogan for Ada Couch, it's a reminder of where she came from. When I was released at 18, the foster mom just told me, hey, you're 18, get out. It was six years ago that the same system she grew up in took her four kids away. I got in a little trouble. I wasn't in a very good relationship, and I lost my children. Now, after being home for a year, her and her family are rebuilding, snapping back from the cycle thanks to another foster child. You know, I really create a hashtag foster care out of rejection. You might recognize her. Kevin E. Gilmore, standing with celebrities, holding her sign, spreading the word, giving a voice to these faces. I feel like that I've been pushed out a lot of the word, so it feels really good to engage a whole new set of eyes. That triggers a whole new level of giving. Tonight, it paid off. This isn't foster kids sitting on a panel, telling their story and re-traumatizing yourself to get uh, a nonprofit money. <laughs> it's 300 foster kids going to see Jay-Z. Courtesy of Jay Z. I met Mrs. Ms. Perez, the CEO of Rock Nation, and she told me, like, I showed her what I was doing with foster care, how many celebrities supported you, like, we're going to give you a Jay Z ticket. Of course, Ada Couch and her son were on the guest list, but so were foster parents, adopted children, birth parents, and supporters. She was such a wonderful person. She who got my hair done. Talisha Martin from the Healing Hearts Foundation brought 18 kids. When I told the parents about it, half of them believe me. But the tickets, the shirts, and the excitement came through. A testament to what family is really about. Thanksgiving is coming around, and a lot of them will be depressed. They will be in a state of depression, but at least this is something that's memorable, that they had a good time. It was a Jay-Z concert. Dorsina Drakeford, Channel 3 News. Showings of the houses that I talked about, going to test drive cars, 
Because it's true, the five people you hang around with are the same people that determine your income. So either you're going to be around somebody that's better than you or somebody that's working on yourself. That's really important. You guys really wholeheartedly need each other. Nobody's better than each other. You all got the same strike. If you can get to college faster from hanging with one another, that's what you need to do. And faculty may not necessarily understand the barriers that are created for foster care and the trauma that comes from foster care. Because oftentimes when people experience trauma, their brains are not the size of a normal person that they're, that's their age. We forget that. Trauma sounds like a word you just throw out there and we use it all the time and people use it in the field, but they forget what that actually means. So please, if you do nothing else after today, get with the other people who are in foster care and really make that, I'm really going to say it, I'm not going to say it, shit happen. Walk the damn stage. I'm going to walk the stage. Walk the stage so I can come back and be out there clapping like your mother. <laughs> Did it work? Okay, so you have to set the stage. You really have to set the stage for that. And I think a lot of times, even though I'm wearing this therapy shirt, most people don't want to seek it because of cultural reasons, cultural myths, family rules, family ties. So many people are afraid to be honest about what they feel. They're great. Half of the people are operating on none the entire time. So I think for me, one of the things that I learned this from, was from reading uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Joe Earlier. If I were you, I would feel the same way. And I found out, right? It's, it's like people don't hear what you say. Even if they tell you their stories, they don't believe in their hearts that you feel where they're coming from. So it's that constant reinforcement of if I were you, I would feel the same way. Damn, if I were you, damn, if I were you, like over and over again, it's like, and they walk out because you didn't interject, they're like, she really felt me. Now in the past, and I used to tell my story, and I talked about that in the clip, re-traumatizing myself sitting on a panel, telling stories so that nonprofits can get money, and forgetting what I've been through in the midst of doing that. They walk around with a check, and then they give me a $25 gift card. That is not good business, right? Now I'm in a different place. I don't care. I don't operate in a fear of loss. I don't feel like I can say the wrong thing to the right person. Good. Oh! You <laughs> And I, I, I really feel like what is for you won't pass you. And all that stuff sounds so cliche, but these last three years of building this campaign and all the hell that I've been through just to afford foster youth access to social capital, it was worth it. All of it was worth it. All of it. I see the young lady over there, she had a sign up that said foster care. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a lot of trouble. I see the young lady over there, she had a sign up that said foster care. I just wanted to, I just wanted to make a lot of trouble. He said job, right? Hey. traumas into your trophies. Yeah. And that's what she's showing. It's a great example that you came from foster care, I was in foster care, and if you inspired me. I follow you on Instagram. I, if she could do it, I could do it. Okay. I mean, could do it. So I really I just want to thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank
you weren't inspired, uh, I'll go low real quick. Next, we'll be transitioning to some words of inspiration. So please welcome to the stage the Vice President of Student Services. All right, so um, this next portion of the event, he read the work. I think it's so important for us to talk about why, why, why we're here. You know, when we first got here, I gave you guys the three reasons why we create this event. LIT stands for Leaders Inspiring Transformation. Well, let's go to the next one. So this is a program called the Next Up Program. Myself, Isabel, and another coordinator from Miramar all came together about a year ago. And they said, hey, it's a state-funded grant, and we want you all to apply for it. We're regular counselors. So they were like, what do you mean you want us to write it? Uh, apply for funding? And so we applied for this program right here called the Next Up Program, called, formerly called uh, KV. And with this program, we're able to support our foster youth. You go on to the next one. So what is the vision of the Next Up Program? The vision is to be the leading college serving foster youth and providing above and beyond support. So what exactly is this program? Basically, I'm going to sum it up. There's no reason for anyone who's able to participate in this program to not be successful. Like, there's no reason. We, we try to make sure that if something went wrong, that you can literally say, hey, that, that might have been me. It wasn't because I didn't have support. It wasn't because I didn't have financial uh, means. It wasn't any of that. It, it was because of me. Let's go to the next slide. So what service do we like? So I'm going to tell you guys, I like this side right here. What side do my students like? They like this side. They get some money with this one. So over the, the summer, we had a group of foster come together, and we had the Welcome Back event. We paid for all their textbooks. They didn't pay for anything. We paid for all their textbooks. Over $12,000 worth of textbooks we paid for. Um, So if you have your phone, I'll leave that up for a few seconds so that you can take a picture of that right there. 
That's the number you call to provide proof that you were in foster care in California. So this all sounds great. There's some people in the room like, oh, that don't fit me. So what y'all got for me? So what do we have for those who do not meet these qualifications? Right? There we go. Say it again. Fast scholars. Fast scholars. We have fostering academic success and transition. Fast scholars is another program where we serve all foster you. The only requirement is that you have to have proof that you were in foster care and you have to be enrolled in at least three units. So same services that we provide for fast, we provide for next up. Students who are in fast scholars, they do not know the difference between the program. They get completely confused. And that's a good thing. That means we got money for both programs. So next one. <laughs> so what are the requirements again? You must be current from a fourth two, three units minimum, 12 units for EOPS. Right? And then again, but you guys gotta remember that statistic. In San Diego, we were the, the we had the most foster youth graduate from college here in San Diego West College. She here? She's downstairs. They, I'll, I'll, when she comes up here, I'm going to have her talk to you guys. So we uh, I wish there was this much excitement and I had uh, people who were really rooting for me to graduate college when I went. Um, but my mom forced me to go to college, which I don't believe was a good idea. Only because she didn't, she just told me I needed to go, but didn't really tell me why I needed to go. I said, there was one school that I applied for, Alabama a and only because they happened to be in the front office that day. I was walking, doing what I do, talking to my favorite secretary. You know how nice school you got your favorite secretary. <laughs> I'm talking to her, and the guy was like, hey, you want to go to college? I said, ah, I don't know. I never really thought of that. I never thought of it. Senior year, never thought about it. And he said, well, just fill out this application. I said, well, I don't have any money. I'm not a good interviewer. He said, well, just fill it out. Don't worry about it. Just fill this out. And um, you know, we'll see what happens. So I go back to New Jersey, uh, where I'm from originally, and my mom called and said, hey, Alabama a and called, you're going to college. And I said, mom, I'm not 100% sure that I want to go. And she said, well, um, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not sure yet. She said, well, great, you're going to college. <laughs> and I try to teach high school students, I just came from uh, speaking two days at a school, I try to teach high school students to figure out what you want to do before you do it. If someone would have talked to me about the plan, like really creating a plan um, and how college would fit into that plan, I'd probably be more excited to go and I'd probably done better. But I believe we fail, we really do fail to plan. So today we're gonna to talk about building a life. You know you build and construct your life, right? It's not like just life just happens to you. Now some of us, for some of us, life just happens to us. Probably because we don't have a destination. We, don't, we just can't see it. I'm asking everybody here to create a vision. See it. Because if I had a plan, if I said, Mom, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. This is my plan. I'm going to start this t-shirt business. I got all these ideas. It's going to happen. This is the research that I've done. She would probably said, okay, I support you. But because I didn't have a plan, she gave one to me. And if you don't have a plan, life will give you one. There are people who have plans for you out here. Especially if you don't have an education, there are people who have plans for you. That's why they create $8 an hour jobs. That's why they exist, because there are going to, there are going to be some people who don't get the education. Make sense? Y'all ready to go? Let's get started. Um, how many foster youth do we have here? Oh, give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> do you know you can be successful? Do you know? Who's the false you use over here? Yeah. Do you know you can be successful? Yeah, now I do. What does success look like? Oh, that part's open to me right now. <laughs> Who else? We got false shoes over here. What does success look like? Um, or how successful can you be? I'm going to be the owner of the National Cup Hotel Resort Hotel Resort Hotel. You're going to be the owner of the uh, That's a big undertaking. What happens if you can't do that? Why wouldn't I be able to? 
I ask high school students this all the time. They say, hey, I want to play sports. I want to be in the NBA. I said, well, what's your plan B? What happens if that doesn't happen? They said, well, if I can't play sports, I'll probably get into sports management. I'm like, well, that's a very tough career to get into. What happens if that doesn't work? And they say something like, uh, well, I'll probably just get a regular job. And I look right in their face and say, you'll probably get a regular job. One out of every 100 people I ask that question for, they look at me crazy, like, what, why? Why can't, other people have done it, right? Other human beings that believe the same as me, done it, so I can do it too. I want to show you some examples. Uh, I was doing some research, this is Tiffany Haddish, I don't know if you can see it. But at age nine, Tiffany Haddish acted as a mother to her younger siblings after her own mother was badly hurt in a car accident. She fed them and dressed them, all while helping her mother recover. By the time she was 12, she entered into what? foster care. She felt a strong sense of responsibility to her younger siblings, and although she had been separated from her siblings, would often find where they were and go to make sure they were taken care of. That's Tiffany Haddish, foster youth, right? Steve Jobs. His birth mother was single, and in the 50s, young women who gave birth out of wedlock were ashamed into giving their babies up for adoption. Can you imagine? She was shamed into giving her baby up for adoption, simply because society says, if you're not married, if you're not married, you shouldn't be having a child. So, gave up Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Paul and Clara Jobs adopted Steve soon after his birth and raised him in California. Lorenzo Malik Malden. He spent most of his childhood with how many? 16 different foster parents as both of his parents were in jail. Malden was selected by the New York Jets in the third round, though. Um, he signed a four-year, $3 million contract. I figure if we kind of show example after example after example of people who are in the same situation you are in, or in the same background, you can at least start to believe that it's possible. I didn't know certain things were possible until I was maybe 18, 19 years old, and I saw a guy who looked like me and came from the same background. He said he didn't do well in high school. I said, wow, me neither. He said he dropped out of college. This, actually, I was 20. I had to be 20 at this point. I went to college 17. Um, right after, I said, you know, I was just dropping out. He said, well, I dropped out too. He made a million dollars. He was a millionaire. I said, wow. My whole life, people led me to believe if I don't get an education, then I'm going to work a regular job. That's why they have $8 an hour jobs for people like me who can't focus in college. But I saw a guy. And it gave me hope. Look, Tommy Davidson, Davidson's mother, was a black civil rights activist in Mississippi at a time when there were a few supports for single mothers. His mom was unable to raise him herself and gave Tommy to a friend, also a civil rights worker, who eventually adopted him. Y'all know who that is? So, so he was partly raised in an orphanage in foster homes. In foster homes. Tom Monaghan graduated last in his high school class, was expelled for pillow fighting and talking to chapel. How do you get expelled? <laughs> he a real pillow fight. From a Catholic seminary and attended college six times as a freshman. I attended college six times as a freshman. Now, you know what he does? That is the man who started the billion dollar company, Domino's. I, I don't know about y'all, but it's stories like this. It's stories like this that really get me going. Because I didn't attend college, college six times as a freshman. I mean, like, just looking at all, looking at all the chips stacked against him. Still, billion dollar company. Is this not motivating to you guys? Yeah. Okay. I gotta ask a question. Um, your life will be shaped by what you what? By what you. By what you are. What else? By what you do. By what you do. Say it again. By what you say and what you do. Anything else? Dream. By what you dream? Believe. By what you believe? Really good one. Let's see. Your life will be shaped by what you say, which will ultimately um, create what you see. What you say out of your mouth will create what you see in front of your face. But what you see will ultimately start to shape what you know. And what you know will ultimately start to shape how you think. What you think will ultimately shape how you feel, and what you feel will ultimately decide what you do. I need you guys taking notes. I promise you, I promise you, this will help somebody. I just want you to take the notes. 
This is, uh, I did very bad in high school. Uh, again, dropped out of college. I worked as a server at the Cheesecake Factory for six years. Before that was Olive Garden. Before that was Applebee's. So I worked at a restaurant pretty much my entire adulthood until I saw somebody. But this is all the stuff that I learned. And I helped, I helped a bunch of people quit their jobs. I quit my job and became a full-time entrepreneur and I traveled the country teaching what I know. And people hire me to teach what I know because what I know, um, I can teach in a very simplistic way. Because I have, I have a, um, a, 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 um, um, what's it called, a learning disability. To where complex, I see complex stuff and it just looks crazy. Anybody ever battled like dyslexia? Or it just looks crazy. So if I see a long email, I can't read it. It's, I, don't, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to retain information, um, but I teach in real simplistic ways because I understand the simplicity. So my weakness for some people is my strength. Because I just see it in plain. So what you see creates what you say creates what you see, what you see creates what you know, what you know ultimately determines how you think, which how you think will create how you feel, and how you feel will ultimately just uh, design how you do what you do. So your life is shaped by what you say. It's the power of the tongue. You know how powerful your tongue is? You can cut somebody with your tongue. I'm talking about you can cut somebody so deep that it'll never heal. No matter how how much you say you're sorry. But outside of that, um, I want you to start giving yourself more affirmations. I know it sounds silly sometimes, but I want you to know that you can be successful. But the only way you'll realize that you can be successful is you have to say it over and over again. You ever, you ever maybe in a relationship where there was a story, something happened between you two. Six months later, I'm telling a story, that person's telling a story, but it's two totally different stories. <laughs> but they tell the story often enough, it's so real to them, they don't even know how, like, why can't you? What do you mean? You was there. You don't remember what happened? You're like, no. But I've been telling the story. You ever met somebody that lies so much, they start to, they start to believe they own not lie? I did that. I did that. I did that. I did that. I kept saying, um, I, I'm quitting this job. I'm quitting this job. I'm quitting this job. I'm quitting this job. I used to tell people next week, I'm quitting this job. I'm telling them, I got this big deal coming. I'm quitting this job. I was saying, I'm quitting this job. I was Next week, I'm quitting this job. Watch this. Next month, I'm quitting this job. I got so much activity, I'm quitting this job. I'm telling you. And then I have to come to work the next month. And they're like, yo, I thought you was what? I thought you was quitting this job. I said, yeah, I had a little hiccup next month. I'm quitting this job. I'm quitting this job. I'm quitting this job. It's so crazy. When I first started working there, I was at the Cheesecake Factory for six years. When I first got there, there was a young lady that I was working with. And she said, I hate this job. I can't stand this job. Every day she was complaining about the job. And she ultimately, six years later, began to hate the job. Listen, I was there. I was there um, three weeks ago. She was still there. I left in 2010. I started in 2004. 2004 to 2019, 15 years, still saying, I hate this job, I hate this job, I hate this job. You are ultimately going to what? Hate that job. And this, this principle helped me. Because my, my mentor said, listen, just start saying, speak those things that are not as if they are. Let the weak say, I am strong. He's saying, you got to start lying. If the weak is saying, I'm strong, that's indicating that this person that's talking right now is currently what? Weak, right now. But let the weak say, I am strong, because one day if the weak says, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong, one day the weak will be what? Strong. It works. If there's power, and we just don't realize, we don't realize how powerful what we say is. But I need you to say it so much. I need you to say it and put it on your wall. I need you to say what success looks like to you. I'm going to blank. I'm going to blank. I'm going to blank. I need you to say it often enough. There's life and death in the power of your tongue. Does that make sense? But don't say it wrong. So we're talking about what we say. Our life is shaped by what we say. I need you to understand how to communicate. Communication is key. It's one thing to say to someone, what's wrong with you? Now, genuinely, in your heart, you want to know what's wrong with the person. Is your friend. You're like, what's wrong? But that's filled with insinuation, isn't it? There's a difference between what's wrong with you and what's troubling you. We can open up a whole conversation by switching a word. So when I want to know what's bothering somebody, it's not what's wrong with you. 
Now, in my heart, I'm saying it in a loving way, but if we don't understand how to communicate, we might lose the person. No lie, I was in a, uh, I was in a mall, I had a kiosk in a mall. And there was a kid, and he was, he was sagging his pants. He was with his, his group of friends. And one of his friends, I didn't know the, I didn't know the kid that was sagging or that, but the other kid came up, came up, he said, man, hey, you came to my school, you spoke, man, I really appreciate it. Um, you really helped me. I'm like, great, that's what's up. So I'm looking at his friend, and I say to him, hey, uh, come here real quick. I pull him to the side because I didn't want to embarrass him. I said, um, hey, why are you, why are you sitting in your pants? He, he exploded. What do you mean, mama? Why, why are you judging me? Da, 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 da. And I'm like, yo, I'm just, try, I'm just trying to understand. I'm going to create a conversation because I'm trying to help him with perception, what people would think about him. Like, just pull your pants up, but I lost him. What I should have said was, how you doing? You all right? You good? Is there anything I can help you with? Yeah, Yo, you look like a sharp young man. I lost him forever now. I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to learn how to communicate. I promise you if you can communicate. You ever found yourself dating somebody that was just really good at communication? And you wound up with the person just because they talk to you good. <laughs> I'm <at> my wife. <laughs> tricky. Fast words. It's tricky. But learn how to communicate. I promise you, what you say, what comes out of your mouth, will ultimately determine where you end up in life. <laughs> Improve your vocabulary. Learn as much as you can, please. They found out that there's a direct correlation between your level of vocabulary and your chances of going to jail. This is the study. They said if you have a small vocabulary, that means you have a small window of what people look. It's like almost you're at a door and there's a peephole and you're looking out at the world through a people. And I'm on the other side of the door, and I'm trying to explain to you what the world looks like. And you say, no, no, I, I understand what it looks like. I see it. I'm looking at it right now. I'm like, no, just come away from But your vocabulary is so limited. All, that's all you can see. And if that's all you can see, your world is so small, all you really need is a box to live in. There's a difference between being able to see it I'm telling you, once you expand your vocabulary, you'll be able to see more. But just learn how to communicate. Does that make sense? I promise you, opportunities will open up to you if you learn how to communicate. If you just learn how to say it. Make sense? And this makes sense too, um, on the jail thing. If you can't, ex if, you're, if you have a limited vo vocabulary, if you can't express what's going on in your heart, you can't express what's going on in your head, you'll probably act it out. If I can't express my feelings to somebody, if I don't know how to say it, I can't find the words, I'll show you how I'm feeling. And we'll end up. Okay. Your life is shaped by what you see. So what you say will ultimately appear into what you see. But what do you see most? How many people on Instagram or social media? How many people spend a little too much time? <laughs> It's called a social media feed for a reason because what you see is feeding you. It's feeding you. What are you feasting on? What are you seeing? Every day. On TV. Music videos. I can't watch the news. I can't. It's just so negative. It's so negative. I can't afford. I can't afford that stuff to get in me. Everything you see, it's a, it's a feed. What do you see? Some of the people you follow on Instagram, you just got to unfollow today. It's necessary for how your life's going to shape up. I need you to protect your eyes with everything you have. Guard your mouth. What comes out of your mouth, make sure what you come out of your mouth is productive, but also you have to guard what you see. Watch this. What are they showing you? The group of people that you're around, what are they showing you? How many people were in a bad situation around some bad friends? And they, every, every time you're with them, the things you see is just so negative. It will shape you. So we got to start to, sometimes we got to take inventory of the people we're around. Do me a favor, pull out your phone uh, and look for your text message thread. <laughs> look, look through your text message thread. We might find the answer in your text message thread. Because what you see might be group text with gossip, 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 gossip. I try. I don't even know how we can do this 
on iPhone, but I have a group chat with a bunch of my friends, and a lot of it is negative. And every time I delete it, I don't know how to block the whole chat. I don't know. So when it comes up, I'm just disciplined enough to not look at it. I just delete it. I don't even read it. If one of them texts me individually, we'll have the conversation. But in that group, it's just so... I don't even need to see the jokes. This makes sense? So if we look through our text message thread or our phone call list, we might find a problem there. Are any of these people where I want to be? And there's a way to change your text message thread or your, your call log thread. You've got to get around people who are winning and just ask them to take them to lunch. That's how I started. I started taking people to lunch. I need you to show me different things. Last part is, what haven't, you seen, what haven't you seen yet? I want you to make it a point this year to go somewhere you've never been, travel. It opens up the world. I need you to travel somewhere, okay? Pick a date, find out how much it's going to cost. Traveling isn't as expensive as people think, but you have to get it. If you've never been to New York, go. If you've never been to Miami, to see how they operate in Miami, go. If you've never seen that beach, go. You've never been to Texas. You've never been to a rodeo. Make sense? I need you to go somewhere, somewhere, somewhere you've never been, and just notice, observe. I need you to see different things. That's why college is so dope, because you get to meet people from everywhere. You get to see one. Your life is shaped by what you know. Now, what you see, what you say will ultimately um, develop into what you see. What you say will ultimately develop into what you see. What you see will always shape what you know. I want you to consume as much as you can while you still can. You're not going to be in your right mind forever. It's a sad truth. Some of the older people in my family, they, it's hard for them to, to learn. To learn. It's hard for them to go out and grind. It's kind of, they, they're not going to agree and roll in college. Listen, you guys are here. And the information is in abundance. I need you to get as much out of college. Listen. In general, colleges are a business. And colleges use students more than students use college. Most colleges, there's somebody over enrollment. They got to get as much people in as possible. They got to get as much people in as possible because it's a business. And some, I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you, I want you to use college as much as college is using you. Extract as much as you can. Go to your professor if you don't understand it and say, I need some help. If they don't want to help you, I want you to look right in their face and say, I pay you. Ooh, come on. I pay you to help me. This is your job. I need to extract because I don't feel like I'm getting my money's worth right now. Bring the sheep. This is how much I'm paying. I know how many, I know how many students you got. Listen, you're getting a portion. I need to... And if a lot of people aren't using you, listen, let me use their portion. I need to extract as much as I can. <laughs> but you, you, you gotta just know. You gotta know. You gotta know. You gotta get the information. You gotta get the information. Watch this. What do you know? Especially about your field. So you want to get into a hotel business, right? How much do you know about the hotel business? Very little? Is it hard to find out more? Um, what is this new web? It's a website that will help you with this right there. Now. It's a uh, oh, Google. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, I've never done it. But I, do we have internet here? Yes. Do we have internet on this computer? Can you, can you just, oh, this would be great. I've never searched it. I've never searched it. But um, I can imagine that if you put how to own a hotel, something's coming up. Let's go, to, uh, let's go to Google real quick. I just want to show you guys an example. Actually, go to YouTube. Y'all got YouTube here? Let's go to YouTube. All right, so um, go to search. How to own a hotel. Let's just type it in. We got how to own a hotel for $200. <laughs> Thank you. Flexibility of owning and operating a hotel. A hotel was just a uh, just a building. Getting a hotel franchise opportunity with Choice Hotels. How to buy a hotel. The hotel industry started walking. I did this in a school, I said, yo, there's, there's no excuse, there's no excuse. 
what, what is the issue that you're having? Uh, any entrepreneurs in the room? Anybody want to be an entrepreneur? Give me something you're struggling with. Leaving a legacy. Let me get how to leave a legacy. <laughs> how to leave a legacy. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. How to leave a legacy. Goodness gracious. Leave me your legacy. How to leave a legacy for generations. The importance of leaving a legacy. Leaving a legacy. Leave a legacy. Motivational video. Leave a legacy. Now, I don't care if it's marketing, branding. Now, here's the thing. I was doing this in a school, and this kid said, well, everything's not over here. I'm sure people don't waste your time with everything. I said, well, he said, why would someone make a video on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? <laughs> Anybody not know? <laughs> so who would take the time to make a video? Because there's, there's a couple components. You need bread, you need peanut butter, and what else? <laughs> Ain't nothing else to it. Who would make, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for your adults? <laughs> how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? If, if, listen, if you're ever, if you're ever in doubt, if you're ever in doubt, 1.2 million extra, exact instruction challenge. This is why kids want to kill me. Now go back, go back, go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Uh, so look, this one right here, um, 50 people try to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich, try to make a PB&J. There was 18,000 people that watched this little girl make, and they were sitting there stuck. I, I, want to, I want to make one, I just don't know. You know I could have had you on, I don't know which one. There's nothing, there's nothing on here. Now there's one student, one student that got real smart. He said, well, there's one thing you can never be. You can never learn how to do. And he said, I said, what's that? He said, uh, how to be God. I said, that's a good one. <laughs> Well, just for kicks and giggles. I get happy God for 500 bucks. I have a strong belief that the information is everywhere. <laughs> Wouldn't we agree that there's nothing that you need to know that's not on YouTube? But the problem is, how much time do we spend researching it? We say we want to do it. We say this is, I, I, I've been saying the affirmations. I'm going to be successful in this, I'm going to be successful in this, but if I ask how much you know about that particular topic, we don't know much. Well, our actions and our words, they don't match. Does that make sense? Cool. Thank you so much. Um, so find out what you know. Find out, make a list of all the stuff that you do know about that industry. Then make a long list of all the things you don't know. And all the things you don't know, spend a week working on that one. Do you realize that that list is 52 uh, points long in a year, you'll know everything you didn't know if you study one every single week for a year. Now, your life will be shaped by how you think. What you know determines how you think. Watch this. What consumes your mind? What consumes your mind will ultimately determine how you think, period. So watch this. And, and, okay, side note, I have an issue. Um, someone living at my house Okay, uh, man can't wait a while. Okay, let him stay here. What should I do? What do you think? What do you think? No, seriously, there's, there's, I, I want, <laughs> who fills my hands? What do you think? How, how do I handle it? How do I handle it? Is it your child? They have, no, no child, no child, no child. Grown folks, grown people. They're grown. Folks. They're grown, people. They're grown. Say it, tell them kick rocks. YouTube. YouTube. Yeah, find out on YouTube. He said, tell them kick rocks, but the person is uh, my mom. Oh, no. <laughs> but but this, is, this is just an exercise in how we think because some people, when we get a little bit of information, we move on it without asking the right questions. Our mind immediately thinks negative. My man said, yo, is it your child? At least asking the right questions. It's just a, it's just a, a thought process. I play a lot of games, like I play a lot of um, like mind games, um, where it causes me to think a little more. You know what I mean? So I want, I want you to be, uh, I want you to really, really consider how you think. But there's something consuming your mind. We only have, we only have, uh, if we have 100 percent of mental capacity, right? If we can use 100 percent of our brain, or whatever portion we use, we use 100 percent of that. If 
if something's taking up 25% of your mind space, that means there's only four things that can, you can really focus on. Now, if there's 10 things, that means all 10 are getting 10% of your mental capacity, meaning there's some very important things in your life that can only get 10% of your attention because you have 90% being taken up by stuff that doesn't matter. What's consuming your mind? Who is a headache? You got any headaches you're thinking about them right now? Okay. You're always wrong. It's always about perspective. I get in very few arguments because I always try to understand how they think. Everybody thinks different. Let me get this off my chest. My, my wife. I don't, get, I don't know how she, the way she thinks is straight. So, for instance, I'm leaving the house. She hates when I get to a certain destination and I don't call her. Sometimes I get to my place, especially when I'm traveling, she just doesn't like it, right? She hates it. So she gets mad at me. And she told me last time, hey, make sure when you get to where you're going, you just let me know you're okay, which is, a, which is good, right? Can't be mad at her. So I leave my house. I'm driving this time uh, with a friend. It was like a five-hour drive. We had to go from Atlanta to North Carolina. Um, and it's a five hour drive, about an hour and a half into the trip. Now she knew I was leaving, I saw the time I was leaving, got started a little later, right? About an hour and a half into the trip, she calls and she says, hey, how's it going? I said, uh, you know, it's all good, we, we on the road there now. And she got mad because I didn't tell her when I was leaving. And I said, hold on, I thought the rules were, <laughs> you only get mad if I don't call when I get to the destination. Now this conversation goes on Two days. I got home and drew it out. I drew out. I'm telling you, like on the sheet of paper, she'll tell you. I drew the house and then a star, our destination. And then this is the road. And I said, yo, you're only allowed to get mad when I get here. Okay, but I was here and you're mad at me for not calling. We never resolved that situation. I just can't see how she sees. So I used to, I used to do my very best to prove people wrong, thus the drawing. I'm trying to get her to see how I think. But one thing, she, she sat right there on the bed and she said, that's how you think? I mean, she still didn't understand it, but at least she's understanding how I think. And that situation got a lot better. Because we're starting to understand it. We just think differently. So I use that point that I'm always wrong. I'm always wrong. Somebody's living in my house. We, but we jump to conclusions and we give people advice. Stop giving people. Right? If, until we understand the whole picture. Make sense? we got to understand how people think. Um, fear versus faith. Fear is... Fear is the... Uh, yes, yes. But fear is the belief that what you can't see is going to happen. Right? Fear is the belief that what you can't see is going to happen. Faith is the belief that what you can't see is going to what? Fear is the belief that what you can't see is going to happen. Faith is the belief that what you can't see is going to happen. It all depends on how you weather. It's all based on how you think. But I promise you, if you're not giving positive affirmations, if you're not talking positive, you'll start to think negative. If you're not giving positive affirmations, you're not saying it, you're not seeing positivity, and what you start to believe, the knowledge that you're getting is from the wrong people, you start to think negative, and we'll wonder why we're in the situation that we're in. Your life is also shaped by how you feel. Emotional control. Emotional control. Don't let anybody steal your joy. Anybody stole your joy this week? You let them own you. There was a manager that I worked at with the, at the Cheesecake Factory, and um, she controlled me. I'm talking about when I walk through the door and I see her working, I'm like, ah. <laughs> she's on this shift, goodness gracious. But I realized it, wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with her, it had everything to do with me because not everybody didn't like her. I, could, I would be comfortable if there's 10 workers and all 10 don't like her, she's the problem. But some people like her, some people did. Some people don't mind working with her, some people do. I hated working with her. But it had nothing to do with her. It had everything to do with me. So I had to start to control my emotions. I had to start controlling my tongue. And I made this challenge. Once I started to see, start saying, I love my job, I love my job, I love my job, I had, to, I had to get that part under control. 
where when I see her, it doesn't control my emotions. So emotionally, I still see her because we had a mutual disrespect for each other. <laughs> you know, it was mutual. I see her and emotionally, all right. Anybody ever have a job like that? Like, yeah. okay, good, good, I'm not the only one. I had to force myself. I said, I need to start to control my emotions because she's ruining every shift that I work on. I said, that's not her thing. So I go up to her and say, hey, how you doing? Now, this went on for about a week where I walk in, I say, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Because she thought I was being sarcastic. Remember the mutual disrespect? She thought I was being sarcastic, but I had to force myself to show love to somebody who hates me. And the craziest thing is, especially the words coming out of your mouth, the more you say it, and when I leave a shift, I'm like, hey, do you need anything? Do you need me to clean anything? We good? She's like, uh, I guess. <laughs> now, I wasn't looking to convert her to my friend, but I was looking to get my own emotions under control. And because I kept saying, I love my job, I love my job, I love my job, once I started attacking this particular point, giving love to someone I know that doesn't like me, I started loving my job. She started asking me, do you need any days off? You straight? Like she, she used to say, yo, you need to work a double today because nobody's coming in on your, your shift. You can't leave. But then she started asking me with respect. Once I started to respect her, it was the wildest thing. Hey, do you mind working today? If you can, I'll ask somebody else. Emotional control. How many people need a little more emotional control? But we need to start writing down what we're bad at. We gotta start writing it down just so we can see it. So we can speak life over that thing, but also when we see it, we, it's, it's in list form. I told you I can't. I got a lot of ideas in my head. If I don't write them down, they'll just stick and they'll jump around in my head like a ping pong. It's crazy. But once I start writing it down, I say, oh wow, that is a problem. I do have a problem with anger. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to get angry. Not today. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to lose my control. I'm not going to lose my control. I'm not going to lose my, my control. I'm not going to get angry. But if we don't have it on the list, if we can't see our problems, it's going to be very, very difficult to fix it. Make sense? So I'm just asking you, do me a favor if you're taking notes or just start thinking some things that you're bad at. Start thinking some things you could really use some, some, some help with. You know your fault. How often do you feel good? <laughs> Take care of yourself. What does care mean? Take time to yourself. Say again? Take time to yourself. How many of you could take a little more care? If you have a newborn baby, you take what? You take care. You take care. So, I mean, you don't, you don't pick them up so aggressively. Like, you take care. If they're crying, you're trying to find out what's going on. Take care. I'm talking about take care of yourself. Okay? Uh, lastly, your life is shaped by what you do. What you have done to get where, what have you done to get to where you are? Life is just a series of decisions. I interview homeless people sometimes. And, uh, this one guy came up to me and said, hey, do you have a dollar, any change, anything? I said, absolutely. I've got a couple dollars on, on me, but I want like, we need to have a conversation. I need some answers. And don't, 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 I don't want you to uh, get offended, but how did you get here? I, I was intrigued. I wanted to know, how did you get here? How did you get in this position? Homeless. Asking for money. No, I didn't say it like that. Right? But I'm, in my head, I want to know, like, what's the story? Then he said, well, right? and he, like, he was really well-spoken. I'm talking about, like, you could tell he was just, he speaks really, really proper, right? Uh, he had a good vocabulary. Uh, but we find ourselves in the middle of downtown Atlanta. He's homeless, asking me for money. I just need to know. He said, well, I had a really good job at one point. Beautiful family, wife, kids. I said, you know, do you know do you, where are your kids now? He said, I don't really talk to them like that. Um, I said, okay, what happened? So I'll give you. I got a whole five for you. I had five bucks. Just need a little bit of your time. So I said, uh, he said, yeah, um, I had a really good job. And what happened was, you know, I would, after work, some of my work friends would party. Right? They'd go hang out. And they would do cocaine. And I said, well, did you do the cocaine? He said, no, not initially. I, he said, yeah, I would say no. I would say no. 
But they kept asking me to come out, come out, come out, and they just kept doing it. They kept doing it, and I, I mean, it was, it, it didn't, it didn't make me want to do it anymore because I saw it all the time. But it just created so much pressure. I just saw it. I just saw it, and it just became normal. And these guys are normal coming to work. Like it's not like how I see it on TV, like crackheads and the itch and the scratch. It's like it wasn't like that. But I just kept going out with the guys. And one night I decided to try. And it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. I mean, it was rough, like, getting in, but it, was, it wasn't bad. And then I kept hanging out with the same group, and um, I started to do it. And then, for some reason, um, we weren't hanging out as much, but I still wanted to do it. And I wound up, um, you know, I kind of got, got addicted, and the people at my job found out, and I lost my job. And my wife saw the problem, and she didn't want to work with me, but I couldn't control my emotions. I couldn't control my anger. And uh, she wound up leaving kids. I couldn't pay my bills. And now I'm right here asking you for money. Through this story, where did he mess up? When you kept going out with the same friends. When you kept going out with the same friends. Crazy. Through that conversation, I go teach that story around the country to kids. That story was so rich and powerful. And some people feel like somebody, like, I just came across hard times. But if we really, really start to look back at our life, where we are today has everything to do with our own decision, what we did or what we didn't do. Look at where we are today, and let's back it up right now. Let's say the average person, they said they say the average person doesn't have a thousand dollars in their bank account. Seventy percent of people don't have a thousand dollars in their bank account. And some people will end up and say, well, I don't have any money because of my job, the situation, blah, 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 I have kids, whatever. But if you really like start to calculate, look back on what you spent your money on, the decisions that you made, it would lead up to today why we don't have $1,000 in our bank account. <laughs> your life is shaped by what you do. But remember, your life is also shaped by what you see. My man, he just saw it. He saw it. And it became from, oh, that's, that's cocaine, it's bad, it's just regular. And I had a group of friends, I thought what they were doing was regular. Everybody where I'm from sold me, everyone. Now I did too, not for long, I wasn't that good at it. I got locked up for like a couple hours, I was done. <laughs> it was crazy, I saw real gangsters that was in there for like real stuff. I said, you know, that was the day that I, I, I decided I'm not a good drug dealer, but also, <laughs> I realized, you know what, I don't even want to smoke that stuff. I saw some real gangsters in there. I was like, I don't even want to be caught with nothing. I'm straight. I quit that day. Hope that. People that have been caught. I said, I'm good. Um, but our life is a series of decisions. Would you agree? What you do with the information today will ultimately determine where you are tomorrow. What you did yesterday is why we are where we are today, good or bad. Some of us made some really good decisions, and we're happy with where we are. I commend you. There are some parents who have maybe a, a rough relationship with their child. And if we, if we really, if we really look back on it, we maybe could have did some things different. Make sense? Okay, what you say will ultimately determine what you see. What you see will ultimately determine what you know. What you know will determine how you think. How you think will ultimately determine how you feel. And how you feel will ultimately determine how you do. The last thing is your life. It's shaped by who you become. Right now, you guys are sitting here taking notes and you're learning. You are becoming something. You're in an environment for growth. You're at a school for growth. You're in this environment. You are becoming something. But I was also becoming something in my group of friends, my negative friends. I was becoming something. And we have to ask ourselves, look at the call log, look at the text messages. The group of people that I'm in, I'm becoming something. I'm becoming something, but is it okay? You need to ask yourself, is it okay what you're becoming? What you're becoming here in college, is it okay? Are you becoming something? You, you, you know what? These classes, everything you do should give you some sort of realization. This week, me and my friends, we went vegan. Just for a week. <laughs> That's all I got for you. But we learned so much. Right? I know I learned a lot. Because the whole, the whole goal wasn't about health, it was about discipline. I wanted to learn something. I wanted to become a little more disciplined. And this doctor, I was talking to him, he said, most people are controlled by their tongue. 
No matter how, how focused we are on a diet, it's this tongue. It's this tongue that it controls us. It controls us. But I became something a little more. And me and Brandon, we was talking, and he said, um, can I talk about your wife? You're cool. I'll talk to my so, um, and I talk about Aaron too. Good, good. Okay, he loves it. So we all went to be. And Aaron said, no, I'm not doing it. Okay? And it was okay. I'm not mad because he said he did it before. And you know, he's just, I'm not with it right now. I'm not prepared. I said, okay, great. So we're all here. We was in LA. And so we would all be making vegan choices. It's hard to find vegan choices. I didn't realize, okay, maybe I messed up yesterday, but I didn't know. I didn't know, no, 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 no. I had some oatmeal, but I didn't even think that honey is a bee. But somebody described that honey comes from a bee. But it's, I was still disciplined because I could have just as easily used brown sugar. I just didn't know. Okay, that's my guess. But Aaron's like, yo, I'm just not doing it, I'm good. So he would get meat choices. And Brandon said, yo, I learned something today. He said, sometimes uh, my wife is on a kick. She might be on a health kick. And I'm just not with it. Like, my wife might go on a diet. And I'm like, well, I'm not on that diet. <laughs> but she'll ultimately, he said, he, he, feels how, he feels how his wife feels now. Because Aaron will come with some meat. And he's sitting there like, yo, why? It kind of, I'm tempted now. And he said, yo, I'm tempted my wife. And ultimately, I kick her off of her, her health kit because I'm not with it and we're not on the same page. He became something through this process. So I want everybody to go vegan this week, okay? <laughs> Check your own discipline, okay? So um, I think uh, that's pretty much all I have. Um, But y'all started clapping already. You know what I'm saying? I don't know how to do it. Okay, I'm done. All right, clap. Give me a round of applause. Thank you. Hey, David, before you leave, do you mind coming back up here real quick? Sure. Go give me a round of applause from back. I, think, I just want to thank you first and foremost for being here, as well as just inspiring us and letting us know that we're in control. Decisions, the, the declarations, we are in control of our future, and as whether you're a former flashlight or, or not, you just gave us that, that knowledge and wisdom that uh, you came to bring us. Thank you. So please accept the swag bag on behalf of us, and we look forward to seeing the great things you do as well as inspiring us. So thank you.